And hello everyone, and I'm, I'm Max. Well, my name is actually longer, but uh, you, prefer, you want to prefer Max. We recently had a new colleague at the Ripen CC from China. He said, well, he sent an email. Hi, I'm Max. I'm uh, blah, blah, blah. his name, I don't remember. You can call me Max, and I replied, no. <laughs> That's me. Uh, who am I? Uh, I work at the Ripen CC. Uh, we are the registry for... You spent your time at Ripen CC. I, sp <laughs> I spend my time at the Ripen CC. Okay. Henning is correcting me. Uh, yeah. Um, so, no, 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 no. And I, I like to say the goal of my job is to not have a job anymore. Because I am the IPv6 program manager. Um, I do training, so I train people. I, um, I also have a voice, a word, in what the what RIPNCC does about IPv6. Um, so, what is this about? Um, making your, your routers future-proof. Why? Because things are changing. Um, recently, we came across an important date. Six years ago, there was World IPv6 Launch Day, which means that actually Wednesday, last Wednesday, was six years after the 6th of June 2012. What does this mean? This means that something has happened. And when I say my goal is to not have a job anymore, it means that I want to see this going better and better. We have we are in a moment where, well, I've been saying this for years, and people start, well, people tend to not believe me anymore, but IPv6 is happening. 50% in India and Belgium, but they have different markets. You know, what's the difference between the two? Why they do more than 50%? There's a big, huge difference between the two countries. What's the cellular GIO? Yeah, uh, Reliance GIO. JIO in India. India is mobile, while Belgium is fixed. Uh, the difference in, in Belgium, you know, Belgium is divided into two parts, and the two, yes, it's, it's more complicated than that, but let's keep it simple. It's actually four, four parts, but there's basically two But it's more complicated than that, you think. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you think it's more complicated Don't, let's... Let's keep it simple. Yes, sorry. <laughs> so let's say there let's <laughs> let's say there was a sort of an internal competition between ISPs to say who would do it first, and that led to Indian Belgium being more than fifty percent. Then I thought, we. I just thought, thought the one side wanted to make sure they cannot communicate with the other side. Could also have been. So a, one is before, one is six. Yeah. Only. Yes. Could be. I think that's Could also be that. Yes. <laughs> Making sure, oh, let's use this new protocol so the others can, don't know it. No. But then also the U.S., around 40%. And you might think, well, I'm from the U.S., I live there, but I don't see much happening in, on my landline. And that's also because mobile, yes, mobile phones in the U.S. are leading a lot. Many other countries are around 30% because maybe one of the big ISPs there moved over, the others are still waiting. But <clears throat> what I like to say is that things are happening. But we also have a changing world. We have more than half of the population on the internet. And if I look at you, you have more than one device that connects to the internet, which means that we need so many IP addresses that we can't live with IPv4 for much longer. We try to stretch the lifetime of IPv4 so much, blah, blah, blah. And then there's this buzzword that I generally don't like to use, but it's true that the Internet of Things uh, is also going to change how we, how we do uh, things on the Internet. There are cases where, <clears throat> you know, also where I come from, I come from Milan, from Italy, and I was so happy to see that they're doing something smart, like putting sensors on the trash bins to see where, uh, to have an idea of how full the trash bin is, and then um, 
give a different route to the uh, trucks. So the trucks would spend 50% less fuel uh, on average. So this means that the internet will be different in five or ten years. And if you think about how it was five or ten years ago, it was also way, way, way different, which might lead to something similar to what we have. Um, I told you I do training. We have an exercise in our uh, basic IPv6 training course that's called Future Casa, the house of the future, where you have smart things inside your house. And again, I don't really like that, the idea of having smart things in the house that much, but people seem to. Um, and this is one of the situations you might end up into. Imagine you have an ISP, you have your V6 internet, you're connected to uh, an ISP, whatever, you get a big chunk of IP addresses, and then inside your house, all the functionalities are split in between different networks. So everything is layer three. So this is what we want to go towards. Does anyone agree? 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 No. Sorry? Agree that this is what we want, or this is what's going to happen? Okay, why would you not want something like that? Of course, V6 is shit. Okay, let's not get into that. <laughs> uh, I, I, know you, I know you, and I know you like to sit here in the front, but yes. I think for the first time, it's not split into multiple networks. It's one perfect for the entire spread network. The routing is done differently based on the last thing that. But I don't know if. I don't agree to the point that you want to spend the network and different classes for Okay, why? Uh, one thing is, I don't know, IT mobility, if you move from one to the other. Okay, yeah, but uh, <clears throat> these are not things that are going to move between houses unless you sell them. Not, not these things, but there may be other mobile devices who want to be part of this network mm -hmm. uh, and may run 15 or 4. Okay. But, yeah, imagine, imagine you have different devices in your house and you want to separate them so that you... So my you point is, like, uh, thread stack, which is right now catering to similar devices, mm -hmm. is not split into uh, different subnets, so slash, slash, six devices. Okay. So, uh, I don't know what we gain by doing this. Well, one of the reasons for doing this can be security, because you can... Uh, you can isolate every single device into its own network and then make sure that, that uh, security is tight for every one of those. Yeah, that can be right. one. I, I think yeah. just having those things hooked up actually becomes a potential security problem. Yes, I, I said initially that I don't like the idea that much, but this is what we're going to get. Because we already have uh, smart thermostats, uh, and if you check those, you have cases where the thermostats lost uh, connectivity to the internet and the houses went up to 45 degrees because they were still thinking, oh, I have to heat up the house. This is not what you're going to get. They will not be on separate networks. It will be all the same. Uh, yeah, well, that's what, we're, what I'm going to show in a moment. <laughs> so, <coughs> ISPs should assign you between a slash 56 and a slash 48. So, enough networks to separate, to then branch your network into something more. Um, and you need to have a slash 64 for each subnet. It's not mandatory, not really a hard line. Uh, many people don't agree on this, and there, ha there are be long discussions, especially at the ITF, about how right it is to have something like this. But uh, for the moment, that's what we have. And if you want to allow Slack to work, stateless auto configuration, that's what you want to have. Consider that in this case, you have a slash 64. It's big enough that you don't have to worry about uh, the hosts in there. But then comes HomeNet. So one day, 2014, uh, no, earlier than that, 2013, uh, they chartered a working group at the ITF, and the idea was to define some rules for how home networks should be and what services you should have in those home networks. So they came up with a series of protocols and functions 
to be used for home networks to fully enable IPv6 and maybe provide IPv4. I've added that maybe. Um, but that's because IPv4, in this case, becomes a second-class citizen. So everything is focused on IPv6, and then IPv4 comes second. So how, how is this? What, what do we get with home net? Zero configuration networks, and we'll see that in a moment. Um, you're supposed to have multiple subnets. In that case, you, you have, <clears throat> let's say, how many of you know what uh, unique local IPv6 addresses are? Okay, do you? So, very few people. Basically, it's the corresponding, I haven't said this, but it's the same as private addresses in IPv4, although they have a totally different use, use case. Those are supposed to be used for internal communication in networks that are not supposed to be connected to the internet. So you're not going to route uh, unique local addresses. They are FC slash 7, FC 00 slash 7. You want to have one of those also in your network, that, that network as a, as a backend. In case you lose connectivity, you can still address hosts using private addressing in that case. You can have multiple routers and multiple connectivity to different ISPs, multiple upstreams with multiple prefixes coming into your network. And together with that, you get name resolution inside your small network because um, it's important to be able to name routers when you, when you connect them. Now, what does this translate into? Bubble, internal routing protocol, very simple, very chatty protocol, was the one that was decided to be the reference implementation for HomeNet. Then you get the HCPv6, client, server, prefix delegation client and prefix delegation server. So that means that you act as a client, but inside your network, you're going to run prefix delegation as well. You're going to run a DHCPv6 server as well. You run DHCPv4, and then, this is the heart of it, the distributed node consensus protocol, which is also called then uh, HNCP, because Home Networking Control Protocol is a profile of uh, DNCP. Basically, what it does is manage who is responsible for services. If you have multiple routers all doing home net, you have to elect the one that will do the DHCP v6 server. You have to elect the one that will do the name resolution. You have to elect the one that will do uh, all the routing at one time. So this, um, this protocol is what you need to um, define who is going to do what. And then you have DNS, you need a multicast DNS proxy, you need a resolver because you need to provide it, and then you have an authoritative uh, server because you have to provide your internal naming services. And then, important still, you have to provide Slack, stateless auto configuration. Now, what are the biggest selling points then of HomeNet? Biggest selling point is that you don't have to configure anything Imagine you have a device with 10 Ethernet ports and you have your Ethernet port coming from your cable modem. You can connect it anywhere you want. You don't have to define a WAN interface because discovery is done with uh, basically DHCP sensing. If I can obtain something with DHCP, then good. That's my external interface. The others will be internal. I have internal naming for my devices. Everything is dual stack uh, with NAT to IPv4. Thanks to Babel, I have loop avoidance. I can basically connect my routers even in a loop. I can daisy chain them. I can add multiple routers as I want, like range extenders. Think about that. And I can also connect them uh, via Wi-Fi, for example. So I can have a router delegate a network to another via Wi-Fi, and that still would work. So this, Sorry, yes? The question about the other discovery, you're talking about how it, it says, if I can find a DHCP server, that's an external. Yeah. So I have a situation where my edge router can be changing from time to time. Yeah. You know, because I, uh, I, I basically live a moving house that goes around the continent. 
Okay. And um, so I have my DHCP mm -hmm. server on an internal machine yes. for my internal network. Mm -hmm. So is my router now going to say, oh, <laughs> there's my external network because it's serving DHCP? No. Um, no, there's a specific case. If I connect a router internally, I, what I use is the, I use a keyword in the DHCP request that says home net. And if I'm an internal, if I'm a router that's internal to my network, and I see a request coming with the home net keyword in there, I just uh, discard it so that I won't be seen in there. Yeah, there's, there is a mechanism for avoiding that. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and that works for both uh, v4 and v6 and prefix delegation. Yeah. But thanks for the question. Now, I have different interface categories, and this is important because I can define, I can define them manually or I can let them auto-discovery. I have the internal interfaces, which are the ones that uh, interchange the NCP information. I have the external ones that are the ones where I can get uh, DHCP v6 prefix delegation. I have the leaf interface just for clients, and then I have the guest for untrusted clients with basically what I haven't discussed yet is also the fact that in HomeNet you have predefined uh, security uh, sets, security policies. So whenever you define interfaces as internal, external, leaf, or guest, um, then they uh, get different profiles for security also. Now, what does this translate into? <clears throat> I used to, at the training courses, I do it uh, manually on a flip chart, but here I decided to spend some time and show you how this could work. And this is a setup that I had at home at, at a certain point when we were testing. Uh, some of the functionalities. So, I have my main router. Imagine I'm a, I have a house and I have my router, I connect to an ISP and I get a slash 48 because I'm lucky. But you can also do it with uh, Hurricane Electric if you want to try this. Now, this is my main router. My main router will have a certain number of Ethernet interfaces. Voila, each and every one of those will get a different slash 64 because that's the way it works and that's the reason why I get so many networks. Then I can connect another router and then there is a mechanism in HomeNet which defines the delegation that should happen here. Delegation should be at least, well when I try it first time, I walk eight bits. I walk two nibble boundaries to get to a slash 56 from a slash uh, 48. And then my local router there will also have different interfaces with different slash 64s because it has enough networks to do that. Now I can connect a third router. I can use another slash 64 and my router here will get a slash 60 because I try to walk eight bits from slash 56 but I end up I would end up with the only ability to hand out one slash 64, which would not, wouldn't be enough for this router to work. Because I need, also this router needs to have one slash 64 per interface. But I walk four bits back and I get a slash 60. And then I can also have another router connected to the main one, gets another slash 56, and then I can also create a loop using wireless if I want. So this is one of the cases where in my house I could create redundancy. And this is all managed by, uh, by my Babel profile inside my network. So it avoids the loops. It makes sure that routing happens uh, in the best, using the best path in this case. Anything to add, Henning? <laughs> You're falling asleep, so it looks horrible, go on. <laughs> so, a router has the IPv6 prefix or prefixes because going back one, one step. Oh, now I ended up in here. <laughs> Sorry. I could actually connect a second router to the internet using a different ISP. And then the, uh, the same scheme of propagation would happen in there. And I would have my hosts, but also my various routers with multiple subnets. And I know this can, be, can sound confusing, but if I have my host, my laptop, with multiple IPv6 subnets, then I can change, I can have one of the ISPs just go away, 
my main router will die, one of the two routers will die, two external routers will die, and I will just stop receiving router advertisements for that network, or I will get a router advertisement with a lifetime of zero telling me to delete all the, those addresses from my host, and I will just move gracefully to the, uh, to the second connectivity. There's also a specific draft, uh, well, it's becoming an RFC that explains how that works. It will be an RFC pretty soon. So, <clears throat> I have auto-assigned unique local IPv6, and I have an IPv4 network out of 10 slash 8, and that is applied at the border. So, every router in my, uh, in my architecture will decide to get 1 slash 24 out of 10 slash 8, and it will be a random one. It will auto-assign an address in there, and in, one, in the OpenWRT implementation, I can decide it to be any address in the slash 24, or just be the first one. Yes? Just one big prefix. I have one prefix for the entire network, but then all the all my local routers will get one slash twenty four out of ten slash eight in IPv4. For ULA, I have one unique prefix. I don't have different separates. No, that wouldn't make sense. Yeah. Yes. So, what do we have in terms of implementation? The only full implementation on OpenWRT. Uh, not in base, but you have to install a separate package. Uh, there's no other known full implementation, and not even in commercial CPEs right now. Not that we have found. And there is sparse software. So there is someone who wrote a proof of concept when developing the uh, home net draft, and then it's just, it just lies abandoned. Or there is a very small <coughs> subset of uh, home net working somewhere, but with no, um, no real implementation. The only one fully working, OpenWRT. And that's the, the one I, for example, use at home. That's the one that's the reference implementation at the moment. So, yes? How, how much of the implementation is dependent on the uh, ISP to provide you IPv4? Um, you can run HomeNet uh, also only on IPv4, but that means that you would have unique local everywhere uh, for IPv6, and that would sometimes, some operating systems might be slowed down by the fact that you have unique local. So because they will attempt to use that to talk to the... Um, Does it provide the NAS6 or DNS? Does that provide, sorry? Does it also provide DNS6 or NAS6 for functionality no. in No, it's not meant to be there. No, it's not <clears throat> not in the specifics. You can add it. You can add NAT64 or 464XLAT if you want. Yeah, I actually ran with that for uh, about a month at home because when uh, there were there was an issue with managing IPv, IPv4 in the um, in the translation and I couldn't I couldn't use it. So yeah, I ran with HomeNet and NAT64 on the on the edge. Yes. So, I was looking at this, and uh, in December, when I became the IPv6 program manager, I, um, I decided to, okay, let's look at this and see if, if there's anything that could be done. So I was thinking, okay, PSD routers are widespread, um, especially in Soho environments, and why can't we leverage this? But I underestimated the effort, and I didn't consider the fact that there was there were many other projects that I would have gotten involved with, so I ended up looking at get, getting a plan, which I didn't end up having fully implemented by now. So what do you have? You have FreeBSD and OpenBSD, and I didn't include, well, PFSense here, because then it comes after you've, uh, you've finished with FreeBSD there. So you have Bubble. Bubble D is in ports. Fine. You have wide DHCP for a DHCP v6, and that's in ports for both of them. That's good. You have a Slack daemon. That's included in base. Simple. But we're missing something, and that's basically HNCP. HNCP exists in different implementations. Uh, there's SN, SHNCP. That's a very simple one. There's, a, there's one in Python. There's also 
uh, but that those are very, very uh, limited. And then there's one, that's the reference implementation, the one for OpenWRT, which has some issues, and I'll tell them in the next slide. But, well, DNS servers and proxy, you can get everything. So you have the different pieces, and then you have to find a way to tie them together. You're missing the one that decides who's going to do what, and then based on this, everything else should be kind of orchestrated, because the way it works is that you, it runs as an orchestrator which tells you should do this, you should do that, based on the priority, based on your capacity, you should do uh, use server managed DNS, you do uh, DHCPv6, and so on. So, uh, we're missing the glue, but I've started looking at it and it's full of Linuxisms. So you have to basically uh, deeply look at that and reverse engineer half of it because it's very, very open WRT oriented and it contains a lot of, uh, lot of stuff that's done especially for it. So you have to actually modify big parts, of, big, big chunks of that. So here, my, uh, my, my idea is to tell you there is this. This is a great opportunity to bring um, uh, IPv6 to uh, the masses, to a lot of people, because it will enable all the IoT, all the new functionalities that we're going to have. And basically, this is it. And I, I'm open for questions. Although you've already asked them during the. Yeah. Well, why didn't you call? Sorry? Why didn't you call? Call. Because I started working on it, and uh, well, I, end, I ended up not having enough time to, to finish that. But yeah, there's, we, can, we can talk. Yeah, okay, good. I certainly know what this is. We've looked at it. Sorry? I certainly know what OMNET is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Please. Uh, so, I mean, I mentioned about I think, mobility, but you, even if it's not I think, mobility, it's one of the router dials. Mm -hmm. You're not changing it. If you move to a different router, then you keep your previous prefix? No, you don't keep your previous prefix. But if you have two border routers, mm -hmm. they will both announce the router advertisements in the network. So you end up with two uh, different prefixes coming from two different sources. And you install both of them. So you have both of them on, the, on your network card at the same time. And then you, uh, you choose which one to use to. Uh, you mean this, this one? Yes. You wanna, you really want me to go through all the? <laughs> <laughs> so here we are actually uh, manufacturing a slash six four here, right? Mm -hmm. Well, not manufacturing. Well, you branch them you're out of it. of yeah. what you're. So yeah. if, if from the top router, if you have to say you had a uh, van connectivity on the lower left router also, and if you were to move down there, it, the prefix. You mean if you move a host from one part to the other? Uh -huh. No, you would have to change it. But as soon, well, if, if, this, if the host does a handover from, say, this to this one, then it will, when it moves, it will send a um, router solicitation and it will, it will get a new router advertisement with the new prefix and would we'll just install the new one and forget about the old one. In which case it's almost like a thing subnet. Yep. So there, like, do we really have to worry about, like, where do you see homenet going forward? The high availability coming from these extenders, which are doing it the layer two and giving you one domain to work with, or what's the doing IP level? Ah, that's a nice question because uh, having having layer two helps in simplicity in the end, because yes. you have one prefix for the whole house and that's it. And you, Aero, but, uh, I think Aero is also, Aero is also working Aero. towards that. Yes, right. yes, but uh, Aero has a different applicability as far as I remember, and uh, 
and in in this case uh, you want to you want to be segmented because you have to locally control everything and make sure it gets routed the way you want the way the the, the local router wants any other question yeah so you know assuming we have the HNCP yeah today mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the immediate would be you don't have to configure much. Okay. You don't have to do much. I imagine the case where uh, you have a grandmother with a router, and then you can tell her to plug the cable wherever she wants, and that would make it easy. Or imagine a house where you have a border router, and then you can connect any kind of other routers wherever you want, and they will just work. Uh, well, most of the time. Uh, <laughs> yes, but then, then you, you, uh, you win with that, um, rather than then having you know, port, uh, range extenders like we were discussing, where uh, if you just have to browse the internet, control a few things, having, having this helps in simplicity and making, uh, making your house easier to manage in the end, the local network easier to manage. So I could get benefit out of it. Yeah, today. yes, but also imagine, uh, oh, sorry. The range, range extenders, you could do that. If, you, if there's a part you want to reach of your house with, a, uh, with another router, you can actually multi-home a router with two other routers using Wi-Fi, yeah. and, uh, and they would just, uh, it would just work. So the, uh, the advantages are quite a, quite a few. Yeah. Yes. I know this was a short one, but there's not much else to say about, about it. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. You can just multi-home, and it's it's very simple. You don't you don't do BGP. You don't do anything else. You just have you just will see the different um, prefixes um, installed on your, on your different addresses from different prefixes installed on your cards, and then it's up to the um, it's up to the uh, host to decide which one to use. Yeah, but there's also. There's also other work being done on multi-homing without BGP using uh, router advertisements, and that's that's a different story. Yeah, Jim. Well, the, the reality here is that most home networks are wireless. Maybe yeah. not for this audience, but <laughs> most people don't have a lot of wire in the wall, mm -hmm. and they take their smart thermostat home and manage to get it plugged into the HVAC, and it runs it up to eleven to to whatever. Yeah. Well, in this case, you would have like for. What is the question? Because you have one one layer to domain, but you don't need much else. Right, but you don't also you don't get segmentation at that point. Right? No, you don't need it. You have one port. Yeah. Unless you do one port. Like well, the thing is, if you have like a two uh, two point four G network and a five G network, then they would be separated. Basically, that would be the way HomeNet would do it in that case. But other than that... Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But that's something probably they uh, was a bit overlooked then to defining HomeNet. Well, there's space for, for a new document here. There's a way to do it. You can actually segment it over the Sure, you can still do that, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's why I say there's space for a for a document for a nice new document. Yeah. Yes. What exactly is the advantage of giving a lamp eighteen quintillion IP addresses? <laughs> you don't have to map. You don't have to map. <laughs> um, well, that's one of the advantages. Um, but, but couldn't that be done with say only one quintillion? <laughs> yeah. Yes, you could, but. Uh, the, the answer, the simple answer is if you, if you don't give a lamp a slash 64, the lamp will not be able to get an address out of that. So unfortunately, there's a bunch of, yeah, yes, you, we can discuss on this, but the way things are is that if you don't give a slash 64 to a, um, to a network where you want devices to connect automatically, then you will be breaking more than 30 RFCs. 
And, huh? Sold? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. We can. Well, with with handing, there's no there's no reason. But yes, sorry. Handing. Give me a second. Yeah. 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 So the way they do that is that they basically th think the same way they think in IPv4, and they force you to to do NAT66 in that case. What's the smallest allocation I can give the customer? Well, there's well you can you can give them a slash 64, but the recommendation from communities a slash 56. Slash 56. That's the suggestion. That's the smallest suggestion you can get. Sorry? Yes. And it can have the band to the translation yeah. In fact, when you that's the point. When you lose connectivity, you will have ULA still working in there. Yes. And that's. And you're part of that network, you also have an IP ULA subject, and you can yep. talk with these devices. Yep. Uh, yes, exactly. What, what I see though is like most of the home devices, other than probably the lock on the door, they have a fixed power source, uh, and they can afford to have a Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. uh, where it just becomes like a normal user end device connected to a Wi-Fi network with the extenders and things yep. are fine. The only place where I see it, sensors or like the lock on the door where you cannot run wires mm -hmm. and get them fired, them to depend on uh, a low power network and that's where those panels and things coming in. Yep. Uh, it's, right now, I, I just see it in the flux uh, Different stack also coming out. What the end would be. Yeah. Yes, well, but we're talking about different things. I mean, if you talk about, I wouldn't put my door lock on low pan because that means that my lock has a reachability of a few kilometers. <laughs> and I. <laughs> yes. It's. I mean, your authentic issue would probably be based on something else. There has to be some other mechanism. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. So it's. Yes, uh, but that's what uh, Jim was saying, that we, we should think about how to segment also uh, the, the wireless part in this case. Because in the, in the specifics, it only mentions the physical interfaces. In the, and, uh, and then you, would, you should be actually doing separation also on the wireless part. Because most of the things that we see now, uh, most of the new sensors or the new uh, devices that we see have a, an ESP whatever that connects to uh, to the local wireless network, and then you have everything on one big segment instead of having all uh, separated. So yeah, we should we should also think about that. Yeah. Do you agree, Jim? Yeah. No. Sorry. There are actually other techniques to do it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So going back to slash fifty six. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Although I'm not here officially for the, right. from the ripen system. When, when you talk to ISPs and they, they try and justify handing out 64s, mm -hmm. uh, what do you and your, um, you know, I live in North America, so I deal with the same problems. You know, what do you all say? We have that. We have that in, the, in our region as well. Huh? Don't, okay. don't worry. But so when you have these conversations with the ISPs, yeah. what, what are you hearing back from them? What, what is their rationale? Why are they doing this? Well, the reason mostly is that Other they. Than, no. The reason is mostly thinking about a, uh, an IPv4 mindset right. and thinking, oh, what's the smallest thing I can I give them? My, my exactly. But then the counter uh, argument is, look at how many you have. Like this small, if I remember correctly, in Arin, the smallest allocation is a 36. Mm -hmm. And if you have a slash 36, we're talking about 2 million slash 56s. 
So, no, it's a half a million, two to the 20, one million, one million. Um, one million slash 56s. I mean, with the smallest allocation you can get, you can serve one million households. Where's the problem? I mean, if you have more than a million customers or you plan on having more than a million customers, you can get worried. But we have a better argument in our region because we hand out, the smallest one we hand out is a slash 32. So you have 16 million. And then without questions, you can get up to slash 29, which means 128 million. Why would you have to care about the single network you hand out to one of your customers when you can serve 128 millions? And we have entire countries with, say, 2 million people. And you, you're one of the ISPs there. And even if there are only two, then the two of you have a potential to serve 256 million households. Why would you, be, why would you have to be careful about what you use? Yeah. Nobody ever needs more than Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's it's the same. You run with the same exact mentality as, as in IPv4. <laughs> yeah. Are there no maybe a stack of the end? Isn't it true though that when you allocate a slash let's say twenty nine that you actually have another that we can actually aggregate you don't you actually yeah. give spaces? Yeah, that's, that's what I, so in reality then, uh, that's not really f fixed and we do it out of, uh, it's not written in stone, but whenever we, for example, you have a slash 29, right? And if you, if you didn't get that way in the past, like more than 10 years ago, what we do nowadays, what we've been doing for uh, almost 10 years is sparse allocation. So basically, he got a slash 29, but we reserved uh, three more bits. So if they ever come back and want to get more address space, we don't hand out a new subnet, but we just enlarge the one they have. So you've got some contiguous growth room. Yep. Yeah. Yes. So, but the same does uh, Erin, as far as I remember. I'm not 100% sure, but, but it's possible. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, well, I'm not saying, I'm not saying anything. <laughs> Not saying anything bad. <laughs> I am. Just saying we, we we have different policies. But we... I'll criticize North America. You don't have to. He's from Texas. He doesn't know. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, we demand our slice of the uh, IPv6 range as well. You know that in theory you could. Actually, slice 29 would cover Texas. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you.